we are starting a new series this weekend, and it's got an interesting title. It's called Gain to Give. And the very simple fusion of two ideas that I have to put my cup out for God to fill me up so that I have something to pour out to somebody else's cup. The idea of giving, living well so that we can give well. And I'm going to start by just sharing with you some of the stories and some of the experience that Jan and I had when we were in the Philippines. Um, we had an opportunity to go, and I, some of you have connected the dots, but there was a young lady who was part of a, she was a foreign exchange student from Norway that came to the youth group where Jan and I were in North Washington 35 years ago. And she was a good Lutheran girl that grew up in church, but she wasn't really saved until she came and was a part of our youth group, and God really changed her heart and her life. And then we kind of lost track as she went back to Norway, and I didn't know where she was for a few years. And God laid on her heart, along with a dear friend of hers from the Philippines named Edith, or Edith, and together, God when they were vacationing on this beautiful island called Camigan, God put on their heart to build a resort that would fund a ministry that would build a church. And 19 years ago, two middle-aged women who had no experience in church planning stepped out in faith to do that. And they, they bought this rocky hillside. Seriously, the, the real estate agent said, it's a little hilly. You know what that means? Yeah, 25 degree slope, all black rock goes right down to the ocean. And they bought that, and now they have terraced it, and there's concrete and rocks everywhere. And everywhere there's a flat spot. Her partner, Edith, loves to do flowers and bushes. And so everywhere you look, there's this lush beautifulness. And they've built, uh, I think there's probably about 40 people that can stay on the site, probably 20 that live there full time. And they have created this incredible, not only an oasis, but it is a spiritual center where God is doing some amazing things. And we got to sit on the lanai, and the, the problem with pictures is they don't show you that this is the first time it dipped below 97 degrees all day. And drip and dip probably are totally, uh, you know, two or three showers a day kind of thing. But the most important part of this was that as we visited and got to know these 24 young adults who are the pastor and worship leader and children's directors and everything in this church of about 120. And they are young and they love Jesus and they're excited, but they're pretty much untrained. And it was an incredible opportunity. And the first day when I stood and I prayed over them as we finished that class, it just hit me. These are my spiritual grandchildren. And how I led somebody to the Lord years ago who's been laboring now for 20 years in this spot. And God is doing incredible things. And I want to use that to kind of jump off into the fact that people say, how was your vacation? It's like, I don't hit anybody. It's not like that sort of thing. But it took us four flights to get there, one of which was 13 hours. You spend days getting there. And there were, during this two weeks, I spent approximately 20 hours teaching and preaching and leading the groups. And so it was a time of intense work, but there were also times of snorkeling and resting. And for me, it was something completely different, which totally energizes me, and it makes you really think about your life differently. And I want to use that to challenge us to the things we're talking about this weekend is that I believe God wants us to work intensely and then rest extremely well. And I am sure that every one of us need at least one, if not both, of those messages. So I want to walk through this as a way in which we look at God's plan for us. What is God's lifestyle that he wants us to have? And I want you to switch over to the right side of that sheet where you usually take the extra notes, and I want you to write down these four things. That God's desire for us is to work well. Do you believe God wants us to work hard? Wow, was it quiet. <laughs> I expected at least some parents of teenagers to really jump in right then. 
Do you think God wants us to work hard? Yes. Yeah, He does. In fact, He wants us to accomplish something with our lives that lasts forever. So work doesn't just have to do with if you're doing a nine to five, punch the clock. It has to do with if you're a student. It has to do if you're retired. It has to do with your a stay-at-home mom or dad. It, it has to do with the fact that God has things for us to do. So here's a verse from Colossians. It says, whatever you do, work at it. How? Yeah. In other words, listen carefully. A follower of Jesus should never do half-hearted work. Right? That God's given us, Ephesians 2.10 says, that we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works. And then it has this amazing line, which God created beforehand for us to do. God has a plan for your life. God has eternal and important things He wants you to accomplish. And so He's called us. He's given us time and energy. And have you noticed that at the end of your week, all your time is gone? Every week? No matter how you invested it, how well you used it, or if you just shot the whole thing, it's all gone. Every week you get 168 hours, and it's all gone at the end. And God wants us to work intensely focused on what he's called us to do. So that's a value for God. It says that we are to work as unto the Lord, not for a human overseer or master. He says, since you know that you'll receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it's the Lord Christ you're serving. So in the Christian perspective, it elevates what we do with our time to a high level. This is to be done to the Lord, for the Lord, and we get to receive a reward from the Lord. So that's a high value. The second part is also something God values, and that is we need to learn how to rest regularly. Do you think God values rest? Yes. A little better. I kind of expected different people to say amen on that one than the other one. Don't you find that true? Some people need to learn how to work harder. You have to set up a stick just to see if they're moving, right? And a lot of people work way too hard, and then they play way too hard, and you need to set up and say, we've got to learn how to rest, and we're going to focus on that for this week and next week. We need to learn to rest regularly. God designed us that way. God designed what the week is supposed to look like. He designed Sabbath for us, and we're going to talk about that this weekend. God also wants us to manage wisely. He gives us time, He gives us resources, He gives us all kinds of blessings. He wants us to use it well, not to just use up, throw away, and buy new, but to use everything well. And then lastly, to give generously. God's goal is that we should be like Him, and He's a generous giver. But you cannot give when your cup is empty. And I don't know, I had an discussion with some people about, I really think people who are followers of Jesus, deep in the core of us, we wish we could be more generous. I wish I could affect more people's lives. I wish I could make more of an impact. I hope that that's the heart. Is you want, I want to be somebody who's a giver. And then we add this word, but I don't have enough money, time, energy, talent, whatever those categories are. But I believe that the heart of a follower is I wish that I could be more generous. So I want you to think of those as four posts, corner posts that we're going to evaluate our lifestyle about. Do I work well? Do I rest, rest regularly? Say that three times fast. Do I learn how to manage my time and my resources wisely? And am I able to give generously? And I'm pretty sure I need all four of those. I don't know if you need three out of the four or all four, but I want us to evaluate based on that. So let's turn back to the other side of the sheet and talk about this second one, which is true Sabbath living. And I want to read some verses from Matthew chapter 11. And Jesus is talking about the fact that, that God has revealed the truths of the gospel and of his own personhood as Jesus, the only way to the Father, that he's revealed them not to the intelligent and the educated, but to the children and to the simple. And then he comes down in verse 28, and he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Now, when you say to somebody, how are you, what do they always say? Fine. If you ask them again, 
No, really, how are you? You know what are the two most common answers I get? Busy and tired. So if you want to read this scripture, we could say, Jesus says to all who are busy and tired, come to me and I will give you rest. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. I believe that one of the crying needs in our culture, one of the crying needs in our church, is for people to learn how to find rest for their souls. We hold up our cups to God and we need to be restored spiritually, relationally, emotionally. We need to be restored physically. And God wants to pour into you and me so that, not so we can be just a selfish, I'm, this is all for me, but so that God can give us what it takes to pour out to others. So Jesus said, come to me if you want rest. I'm the source of it. And then he uses this picture, take my yoke upon you. Now, if you don't drive teams of animals for a living, you may not know what a yoke is, but it's the wooden piece that would go between animals so that they could pull, or even on one animal, so they could pull a load And in the Jewish context, if you were a Gentile convert to Judaism, they call it accepting the yoke of the commandments, so that I'm going to take on for my lifestyle the obedience to the commandments. And in Jesus' day, rabbis had different understandings of how the Old Testament law was to be interpreted. And so rabbis had different understandings. So when you adopted a rabbi as your rabbi, you took the yoke of your rabbi. And Jesus said, I want you to take my yoke. It will teach you how to live without being burdened and weary, because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And we're going to talk about how does that work in our lifestyle. And I want to use this idea of Sabbath, which the scripture talks about a lot, What does it mean to have Sabbath? And Sabbath is more than just not working. Sabbath is this sense of renewal and being restored and being recreated. And I find that many, many of us don't know how to do that. Oh, we can play, but you play for the weekend and you're tireder than you were when you left. And I think I read a great book and it was called Entertaining Ourselves to Death. And it was talking about this tendency that we have when we've pushed hard and we've worked, then we want to take time for ourselves. And often, have you noticed how hobbies have a tendency to take over your life? Or your kids' hobbies have a tendency, or their sports take over your life? And there's all kinds of things that begin to come in, and they make us busier and busier and busier. And the question is, is that God's yoke for us? Is that God's plan? And so I want to talk about Sabbath living And I want to talk about it carefully because I think most truths are the center path and there's a ditch on either side. And people have an amazing ability to find the ditch. So the center truth is that God created the Sabbath for man and we need to learn how to live in working hard and resting regularly. The first ditch that people fall into is instead of saying, I want to live as God designed me to live, I want to live in Sabbath rest, is they go to the second stage where they start talking about all the regulations. When does Saturday start? It starts Friday at dusk, and then it goes to Saturday at dusk, or we just switch the Sabbath and we now make it on Sunday with the same kinds of rules. And Jan said she grew up in a home that was a little confusing because on Sunday you went to church and then you couldn't sew in the afternoon, but you could play soccer with the youth group. It was like, I'm not sure exactly how this all fits. And there was all this kind of confusing set of rules of what you could and couldn't do on Sunday. How many of you grew up in a home where you had some confusion about that? Yeah. So what happens, the first side, of the first ditch is that we try to grab from the Old Testament and we take some of it but not others and we try to make up a list of here's how we're going to do it or here's how I'm going to do it and I think you ought to do it too. And so the first, the the peace that Jesus says when he's talking about this. He talks about giving us rest from the toil and the burden. 
And you understand that the time frame in which Jesus was talking is that he goes back and he's quoting, excuse me, we're not subject to the Sabbath regulations, to the laws of the Old Covenant. Because in the Old Covenant, they had to have circumcision, they had to have the Sabbath that they kept, or they died. They had to have temple worship, they had to have sacrifices, there was a whole part that was the Old Covenant. And people sometimes try to take those rules and they try to bring them into the follower of Jesus, has to obey all of these things. The book of Galatians is all about that. And people in our day, you will run into Christians who will say to you, if you really love Jesus, you wouldn't do any work on the Sabbath, and you go to church on the Sabbath, and when is the Sabbath? Saturday, Saturday. right. So they try to take that, and then others try to take the same regulations, and they transfer them on to Sunday, and we worship on Sunday because it's the resurrection celebration. But it was a special sign between God and the Jewish people. Look at this verse from Exodus 31, where the Sabbath is given. Six days work is to be done, but the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest. Now remember, this was given when the children of Israel had been in slavery for 400 years in Egypt. What kind of schedule does a slave work? <laughs> when do they punch the clock? They're on call 24-7, aren't they? So God's taking them from a life of slavery, and he's trying to help them live in a life of work and rest. And so he says, six days, work. Seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest, holy to the Lord. So this is between you and God. And then he says, whoever does any work on the Sabbath day is to be put to death. I don't find anybody wanting to take that part of the verse. Then it says, the Israelites are to observe the Sabbath, celebrating it for generations to come as a lasting covenant. It will be a sign between me and who? The Israelites forever. The Sabbath is always given in a Jewish context. And then he says, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed, this version says. Isn't that interesting? So, Jesus' day there was a whole bunch of confusion about the Sabbath. The Jews had taken a general idea of don't work on the Saturday, and they had defined 39 kinds of work you couldn't do. And every one of them was parsed down to the finest detail. So that if you threw a rock and it landed on your property, it wasn't work. If the rock landed on somebody else's property, it was work. You could walk so many steps, and if you went over that, it was work. You could, and in fact... If you visit Israel today, and if you're there on Saturday, let me encourage you to avoid the Shabbat elevator. If you're on a hotel that has 20 floors, they can't touch the button to make the engine work because that would be work. So at every floor, the doors open, they wait a while, the doors close, and you go up to the next floor. The doors open, it can take you all day to get to the 20th floor. So go to the Gentile elevator if it's Sabbath, let me just tell you. So, so here's the funny point about the New Testament. Jesus, the Holy Son of God, who gave the commandments, kept getting in trouble with the religious authorities because he didn't do Saturday right. And it was a craziness that Jesus reacted against. Remember his disciples, the story where they grabbed a little grain and they rubbed it in their hands and they ate a few you know, pieces of wheat? And the Pharisees said, see there, that was harvesting and threshing, two of the prescribed activities in on the Sabbath. And so Jesus reacted against him, but Jesus is the one that said, Sabbath was made for men. We need that. And in fact, in the New Testament, it says, one person considers every day, one day sacred, and the other person considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in their own mind, and it goes on to say, each one should do it as to the Lord. So the funny idea that the Jewish people got, and that sometimes we get, is that God owns a certain part of my time. How much of your time is God's time? It's the same mistake we make with money. How much of our money belongs to God? A tenth? No, it, it all belongs to God. And so... Romans is saying if you grew up in a Jewish background in a context and you're used to taking that day off, that's okay. If you've grown up in a Gentile context and you can take some Sabbath all through the days and you see all of your time as belonging to God, that's okay too. 
So the one ditch is people try to figure out how many rules and when do I cook on Sabbath and what can I do on Sunday, and they get all caught up in the rules part of it instead of understanding the heart of it. The other ditch is that people just keep working like crazy. And we work too hard, and then we do our hobbies too hard, and then we take our vacations too hard, and then we don't sleep very much, and we're on screens all the time, and we live a frenetic and crazy lifestyle. And if I said to you, how are you, the real answer would be, I'm bedraggled. I am worn thin. I am tired. So here's an amazing idea. If we follow God's plan, He teaches us how to live in Sabbath living. He teaches us how to work hard and to be purposeful and intentional, and we also need to learn how to rest. So the first important understanding of Sabbath is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Sabbath. In in Hebrews chapter 4, it's kind of a confusing chapter to take you through, but the writer to Hebrews says very clearly, there is a rest for the people of God. And you know what the rest for the people of God is? Is when you understand the gospel that you and I can never be good enough. You can't possibly add enough good activities and quit enough bad activities to be pleasing and holy to God. And that you come and you believe in Jesus and you accept Him as your holiness and He is the one that gives us our goodness. I can't be good enough, but God sees me in Jesus And so so then he says, if you understand this kind, then you cease from your labors. You quit your trying to work to please God. Because here's the good news. God is already pleased. He's pleased in Christ. And when we're in Christ, we are forgiven and we are whole. The Bible calls us saints. And you think, have you seen me? But the Bible says, I see you in Christ. So, we come to, first of all, realizing that I don't have to work hard at keeping Sabbath or anything else to earn my way and my pleasing of God, that God is pleased. But because of that, I want to live in connection with Him. So, let me give you some clues about how do we take time for renewal. We're going to start it this weekend and continue next weekend, but let me just be very, very clear about this. If you don't get intentional and schedule in time for renewal, the craziness will take over. Is that true? There's always more whirlwind than there is sanity. No matter what you're trying to do in your life, and if you have children that are in school, then it's triple, because there are more things that you can possibly do. The to-do list is too long, and... You know, God loves you and everybody else has a wonderful plan for your life. So all kinds of other things start coming in. And so we've got to start saying, I'm going to take time to restore. God has a value for me restoring and renewing and being filled up. Listen carefully. I need to start valuing it more. Some of us need to learn how to work more intentionally, but I think most of us need to learn how to rest more intentionally. And so it starts very specifically. You need a time of daily renewal. It is never exactly the same for all of us. So the real question I want you to wrestle with all week long, and we're going to talk about next weekend, is what do you do that actually restores you spiritually, physically, emotionally, relationally. And here's the definition I'll give you. It's when you are rested enough that you feel like, okay, I'm ready to get back in the game. I'm ready to get back into pouring my life out. Instead of that thing when somebody comes and asks you for help and you're like, man, I got nothing. I am so empty. I got nothing. So the point of restoration is to fill you back up so that you can be ready to give out. It's not just to be on vacation. It's not just to do nothing. The goal of life is not to do nothing. And isn't it funny how we need to learn how to stop things? And I would encourage you, one of the strong practices of my life is to start in the morning and to open up the scriptures and to spend a few moments just reading and thinking about what's my relationship with God like? 
and to take some time to pray. Last week, if you weren't here, we talked about anxiety. And God's goal is that we would be anxious for nothing but learn how to focus our prayer and focus our thinking and to live a, a life where we are giving God our problems and they become His problems instead of us walking away with them. And the morning is a time for surrender and for getting your mind focused and for even taking all the anxious things that are coming at you and give them to God at the beginning of the day. We need time to renew our relationships. The sad thing, I saw a family that was sitting in a restaurant and they were all sitting there and everybody was sitting around the table and you know what everybody was doing? There were four people and they were all texting people that weren't in the room. I mean, I hope you're not texting somebody next to you. That's like a really sick sign, but we get so involved with keeping up with everything and everybody that we have a thousand relationships that are an inch deep and we need time. I'll tell you this absolutely, you cannot build deep relationships without time. You can't have quality time without some quantity time. You can't zip in and say, I got five minutes, tell me what's on your heart. And then I'm moving on my schedule. It doesn't work that way, does it? Jan and I try to take, in our busy schedules, we try to take lunches together several times a week and just catch up with each other and how are you doing and what's going on. And I have people that I meet with weekly that are important people in my life that help pour into me and I pour into them. And you can't build deep relationships with everybody you know. You've got to focus on those people that God's called you to. So we need times where we, we renew daily. We need to have times. <laughs> you need to sleep. What? No amens? Man, I can't believe it. We need time of rest, don't we? And quite often, we're staying up way too late and getting up way too early. And we need times to sleep and to restore. God created us that way. So daily, we have to have a rhythm of grace that is working hard, resting well. We also need times of weekly renewal. Your weekly rhythm, Jesus, or excuse me, God created the earth in six days. Patricia Shire, or Priscilla Shire has a great observation about that. She said, God could have just said he created the world in six days and quit. But it says, and on the seventh day he, was he tired? So here's the Jewish statement, on the seventh day he created rest. That that's what he did intentionally. And Jesus said he did it for us. Because going all the time full out will wear you out. And whether you burn out or rust out, you're out. And so we need to learn a weekly rhythm of time off. It needs to be relational time, family, friends. We need to have times where we sit around the table and talk about our lives. We need to have time where we are connecting with people. You need to have time when you're just relaxing. And here's why it's different. If you work really hard with your brain all week long, you may need to relax with your hands. I love going out and mowing the lawn or cutting some firewood or doing something. That's, that's a relaxing part. If you work all week long physically, you may need to relax in a different way on the weekend. So we need to learn those rhythms. But here's what I'll tell you. Our hobbies can eat us. I remember playing this video game with Civilization, and it starts with you, you know, you get your village and your city and you start giving your people food and you start preparing and then you get bigger and then you get other cities and then you get other cities. And I remember sitting down at the game one time and going, oh, that's a lot of work. This is a lot like I do at work. And you can do it with anything. Oh, gardening, it's so refreshing and renewing. So I planted 20 tomato plants and then you plant five zucchini plants and it's like, you know, that's why people around here lock their door in August, right? You lock your car doors in August because people will leave the zucchini if you don't. <laughs> and the things that we do for relaxation can grow to such a place that they are no longer relaxing, can't they? And I think we often think, I'm filling all my time, but am I doing what God called me to do? And am I resting and restoring and renewing and recreating? Or am I just busy? And I think we need to do some strong life evaluation. 
What is my rhythm? Because you know what? You may have done it last year and your life has changed. And every season is a new challenge related to how old your kids are, what's your living situation, what's your work situation. It keeps changing. And you got to come back to saying, God, what have you called me to do? And I'll tell you, you will never get through your to-do list. Ever. I used to tell Janet at the end of the evening, and we should be cleaning up and trying to get things ready for the night. And I said, oh, just leave it. It'll be there tomorrow. She said, that's not encouraging, you know. (laughs) But it's the truth, isn't it? So here's the point. You've got to put the most important things at the top of your to-do list because you probably won't get to the bottom. So are we doing the the high-priority things? And then are we resting and taking time where we renew spiritually? Daily, weekly, and seasonally. Seasonally means that there's times in our life when you just got to push hard. You know, it's kind of like harvest time if you're a farmer. Man, you just got to forget everything and it's, you got to get the hay in or whatever it is. And there are times in our life which are high pressure and very busy and lots of energy required. But you can't keep living that way. And if you're one of those people who keep saying, well, summer will be better, and it's not, and winter will be better, and it's not, and spring will be better, and it's not, if you just keep picking up the pace, you know, Howard Hendricks said the definition of an idiot is somebody who, when they've lost their direction, they double their speed. And some of you may feel like that's your life. You don't know what you're accomplishing, you're not sure what God's called you to, but boy, are you going fast. And let me tell you, bad accidents happen at high rates of speed. So let me encourage you to think about seasonal renewal, taking a week off, taking some time with your family, taking a real restful vacation. And one of the things that we tried, and honestly it didn't work very well when our kids were little, but we would take a week of vacation. We would read a passage or a book of scripture together. And that was part of our time together. We made that a, we didn't do so well when it was all week long, but we, on our vacations, and And I remember an incredibly great vacation where we went to an exotic place and it was all kinds of fun, but we read through the book of Ephesians together and my my daughters were in college at the time and they were reprocessing what God was saying to them at that point in their life. And it was a nice vacation, but you know, that's one of my favorite memories out of it because it was deep and renewing and it was drawing us to Christ and it was drawing us to each other. And I long for you to have valuable and meaningful work that you're doing. And I long for you to have rest that's real, good sleep, times when you take off, times when you restore and you renew and you get filled up. And it's not the same for everyone, so you've got to wrestle this through for yourself. And I'll give you some ideas. Next week we're going to talk about this as well. But you've got to try it on and see what really works for you. We need to serve God with our whole lives. I'm going to hand off to Pastor Will in Green and Pastor Sky in South County. And I want to ask you two questions just for you to walk away with and think about. Do I work well? Ask yourself, when, what has God called me to in this season of my life? And I don't care if you're a student, if you're retired, or what your job situation is. God has a purpose for you right now. Do you know what that is? Are you clear about it? Are you pouring yourself intentionally into what God has called you to? If you're not, that's what God's saying to you today. I've prepared good works for you to do ahead of time. Let's get together and do that. And the second question, which is probably for a lot of us, is am I resting well? Do I have recreation or am I just... Busy playing and then busy working and then busy and dead. And ask yourself that. Do I have daily rhythms? Do I have weekly rhythms? Do I have seasonal times? How am I doing on that? Because I totally believe that this is a God-honoring lifestyle. To pour it on and to make a difference. And as I went to the Philippines, it was amazing to get to talk to these young adults that Venka has been pouring into for the last... 20 years, some of them, and to see what God can do over a period of time with somebody who is dedicated and focused, and then also to take times of rest and restoration 
and asking yourself important questions. So as you go through this week, watch yourself. What is it that drains you? What is it that restores you? What is it that's eating up your time? And begin to reevaluate. Let's pray. God, thank you that you are very involved in our daily schedule and that you want us to live in connection to you and to serve you with all of our hearts, working not like somebody else is watching, but like you're watching, God. And then you also want us to enjoy the gift of rest, to restore and renew. And Lord, I need that one. I, I tend to go too fast and too long and too hard. And I need to learn how to stop. And Father, I know there's some other folks here that have that same struggle. Help us to ask ourselves that honest question, how am I doing spiritually and emotionally and relationally and physically? And that we would find that balance for each one of us. By your Spirit, would you challenge us all week long? Help us to have that self-awareness that goes, oh, there it is again. And to hear what you're saying to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We're so glad that you're joining us by video. And uh, I know that some of you are just from our church family here, and you're uh, just watching because you can't make it this weekend in person. And I know some of you are watching from around uh, the world, really. And so we just want to say we hope that God blesses you through this. If you have questions, feel free to email me, or if you'd like to let us know um, that God is using this in your life, that's always encouraging. And we have several of you that, that email occasionally. So if you have questions, if you have comments, anything you can... Uh, Give us some feedback. We'd love that. And we trust that God will use this to really enhance your spiritual journey. Thanks.